Thank you everyone for joining us online. Uh, if you join us for the first time, uh, this is Global Minds for Ukraine, an initiative which we launched during the invasion to have this opportunity to talk to the world leading intellectuals, scholars, artists, to raise awareness about what is happening in Ukraine, but also to uh, provide this opportunity to Ukrainian students and scholars to uh, do what they have to do what they know how to do best, you know, to consume knowledge, to discuss knowledge, to share ideas with world leading intellectuals. We were honored to have many guests on this series of uh, events and uh, lectures. And today we are especially honored to have a very uh, special and unique guest who is a world uh, famous uh, researcher in cognitive psychology, in, um, in the science of language. Uh, he has published a lot of books that are translated to languages around the world. And he recently uh, published yet another book, uh, which you can see uh, the name of the book on uh, the background, Rationality, what it is, uh, why it seems uh, scarce and why it matters. Steven Pinker today with us. It's a great honor to have you. And I will be moderating uh, this conversation, this podcast with you. My name is Timothy Brick. I work at uh, Key School of Economics as a rector of this university. So thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Sure. And, um, you know, we we want to um, have this op opportunity to discuss with you your new book. You obviously have studied a lot this uh, subject and you care so deeply about it. But, you know, perhaps my first questions uh uh, could seem a bit naive, uh, and they might come from ignorance, but I also think it's important for our audience, you know, to get into the very basic ideas and concepts which you uh, discuss in your book. So maybe we can start, you know, from the basic uh, basics and discuss what is rationality? Yeah? How can we define rationality, how you define it, and whether it can be measured? And uh, basically, how do you know that uh, it can be scarce or not scarce? The, uh, I define rationality as the use of knowledge to pursue a goal. Rationality can't tell you which goal to pursue, but uh, given that you have selected a goal, it can tell you how you have to think in order to obtain it. The, uh, it raises the question of how can, can knowledge be used to attain goals? And the general answer is through normative models. These are models from philosophy, from mathematics, from uh, social science, from artificial intelligence that uh, serve as guidelines for how you ought to reason in order to obtain a given outcome. They include logic and probability and uh, the special application of probability to um, uh, <laughs> to belief that's called Bayes' theorem, B-A-Y-E-S. Um, the theory of rational choice or expected utility, game theory, correlation and causation. All of these are um, used by, by scientists and social scientists and philosophers as kind of as, as benchmarks as to what sound reasoning uh, consists of. Then we can compare how humans think to these normative models. And that's one way to answer the question, are humans rational? In which ways are they? In which ways are they not? Yeah, so I assume um, all the things that you just listed, uh, the concepts of probability and logic and everything else. So this is something that can be measured. Yeah, so whether people are capable of doing some basic calculations or predictions or even understanding uh, probability. So I guess my Next question would be whether rationality is something given that it can be inherited by people or this is something that can be learned as a skill or uh, even predicted by your culture. Perhaps some cultures, they uh, value rationality more than others. So if you happen to be born in some culture, you might be more rational than a person who was born in another culture. So can you um, disentangle culture, skill, and inheritance when you're talking about rationality? I think all of us are born with um, a, a certain <clears throat> core of rationality, or at least it develops in all cultures, because people have to reason about the world. Uh, otherwise, they could never 
um, uh, get food, um, keep food in the refrigerator or, or uh, uh, petrol in the car or hold a job or get the children clothed because the laws of reality are the laws of reality. You have no choice but to follow them if you're going to get anything that you want. And humans are a very successful species. We've, we've, caught, we've uh, uh, spread out over the entire planet. Uh, and th this is because in all cultures, including ones that are um, <clears throat> uh, pre-literate, hunter-gatherer cultures, uh, they use a lot of rationality. And I, in fact, I begin my book, Rationality, by talking about the uh, hunter-gatherers of the Kalahari Desert, the, the San, and how they uh, use rationality to figure out which animals left behind which tracks and uh, how to find them and outsmart them and trap them. Um, but there's uh, that kind of intuitive rationality that we all have is not enough for a modern world. We, we have, um, over the centuries, developed tools that are much more formal and abstract. That is, they're not about animals and about food and about uh, other people and about promises. Uh, they are abstract formulas. P implies Q, P therefore Q, the uh, uh, probability of a hypothesis given the data is equal to the probability of the hypothesis times the probability of the data given the hypothesis divided by the probability of the data. These mathematical formulas, which make our can make our reasoning much more powerful because they don't depend on acquaintance with uh, concrete world with our own experience, you can plug in any values and um, <clears throat> uh, attain goals, deduce true ideas. And so they're far more powerful. Th these are not universal. These are a product of the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think any culture consistently applies them, certainly not uh, any uh, American or European culture, but they're a kind of aspiration, a kind of goal. That's how we ought to reason. And modern cultures, at least in theory, modern uh, democracies, modern scientific establishments, try to set up the um, models of, of normative rationality as the uh, as the goal, as the benchmark, as something that we should try for. Now, we're only human. We all, don't always uh, succeed in any culture, but the uh, we can almost define modernity as trying to organize our affairs according to rational principles. Yeah, and it's interesting because you mentioned that there is a, some sort of a progress in rationality. The more we discover mathematics, the more we go with uh, scientific progress and make our um, technologies and our society is more and more complex, we expect that we should see more and more rationality in the world. And yet, the second part in the title of your book is why it seems scarce. Yeah, So an argument could be made that perhaps there is some scarcity in rationality now. So I'm a bit intrigued by this word seems. So yeah, the, is well, it really scarce or is it just a perception? So what's happening there? Well, in some of these, there's an awful lot of irrationality uh, in the world today. Uh, we see, I mean, I don't have to tell the people of Ukraine that the uh, the, the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine was completely uh, irrational by uh, any criterion. Uh, but we also see it in conspiracy theories, in fake news, in uh, people's belief in uh, paranormal, like spirits and reincarnation and uh, crystal uh, power and spiritual energy in pyramids and mountains, uh, in, in uh, quack medical cures like homeopathy and bloodletting. Um, so there's, there, there is both. I think people are, as I mentioned, they're certainly capable of rationality in their everyday lives. Even people who believe in a conspiracy theory or who uh, believe in uh, homeopathy, they generally can show up to work on time, they can find an address, they can uh, pay their taxes. So there is a certain amount of rationality that every, everyone has. But in the public sphere, in big issues where we define our identity, um, what is the origin of the universe and life? Why do bad things happen to good people? What, uh, what determines the big events in history? In a, a lot of these big cosmic questions, 
uh, most people have no way of finding out the truth, and they just believe whatever makes their own uh, side feel good, their, their tribe, their nation, their religion, their coalition. People, people's beliefs are often a sign of their moral identity, of who are the good people, who are the evil people. And the idea that uh, ideas about why do people get sick, wh what is the origin of life, what really happened to cause World War II. The idea that you can answer these questions, that there is an objective truth, and they can be found by scientists and journalists and historians and uh, government record keepers. That's something that people, most people don't really sign on to. People who are highly educated, who are part of the uh, post-enlightenment civilization, believe, well, all of your beliefs should be grounded in evidence, and that evidence should come from our best expertise, from our science, from our best journalism, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so on. That's where people often are, uh, are, are quite irrational. So it's in the combination of the bias to make your side look good, sometimes called the my side bias, for obvious reasons, and people's um, willingness when it comes to issues beyond their own experience to believe in satisfying myths as opposed to the best objective reality. But uh, so um, there is that, that division between people's lives and their grand uh, mythological beliefs. Also, the reason that I say myth that reason seems scarce is that reason is, rationality is quite plentiful in science and engineering and technology. We have uh, with, uh, vaccines for COVID, we have uh, artificial intelligence, we have um, spectacular progress in evidence-based medicine, in evidence-based policing, even in evidence-based sports. Now every sports team in the United States has a statistician. So instead of relying on intuition and the common sense of coaches, they go to the statistics and they look up which strategy and which player are, are most successful. So there are many, many areas where the world has gotten more rational. And then, of course, many areas where it has stayed as irrational as it's always been. Yeah, that's a very interesting comment about sports, uh, applying these new styles of management, relying on data. I know that there is another argument, especially, you know, from the people who often work in this industry, that also it makes sport to look uh, sometimes boring and too predictable. So uh, do you think that there is something in our nature that people also follow aesthetics and fun, and that's why they uh, resist rationality and the spread of rationality in some in some fields. Um, I, I don't think so because I don't think that pleasure and beauty and fun and love are irrational. They're perfectly rational, I mean, they, and and again, rationality helps us pursue goals, but it doesn't tell us what those goals should be. We're human. We we love our families and, and our friends. We have a, a sense of beauty. We have a sense of fun. We like to dance, we like sports. And uh, there's nothing irrational about indulging those. Yeah. This also reminded me um, about another lecture which we had with uh, Nicholas Christakis, who is also... Oh, yes. He's a friend of mine. Yes. Oh, oh great. So he... He presented his uh, series of research, and basically he had this argument that in the very long term, altruism and kindness is uh, something that is um, fundamental for the survival of uh, human societies and communities. Uh, not you know brutal aggression, not competition for resources, but kindness and altruism. And I think this is often overlooked that think there is some always a stereotypical perception that if something is nice and kind, it's sometimes perceived as weakness. However, from his uh, research-based point of view and you know similar to what you just said about love and kindness, it seems to be that it's quite rational to stand by these uh, values, you know, in the... Yes. In the well, it is rational. It is indeed. I mean, it's rational in the sense that if we had to come... Um, to an agreement on how we should treat each other. Mm -hmm. Then if you can consider one possibility as well, I get to rob and beat and, and, and hurt you, but you don't get to rob and beat and hurt me. Well, you're gonna say, well, no, I'm not gonna to agree to that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So that's, that can't be rational in the sense of something that all minds can agree on. What about, well, I get to steal and rob and injure and rape you, and you get to steal and rob and injure and rape me. Well, I don't think we'd agree to that either, because the harm that comes from exploitation and damage is much greater than whatever extra benefit or pleasure you get out of exploiting another person. So we're really all better off if we agree to live in peace and cooperation. If I'm in danger of drowning, you extend a branch to save me. If you're in danger of drowning, I extend a branch to try to save you. We're both yeah. better off. It's highly rational. Uh, now, of course, the, the reason that we don't all live in a state of peace and cooperation is that there's always the temptation to cheat, to say, okay, you can, you'll be good to me, but I can uh, harm you, I can steal you, I can steal from you, I can exploit you. And that temptation is always there. But as soon as you depend on uh, others for your well-being, as soon as I say, hey, no, don't, don't hurt me, uh, uh, if you see my child in trouble, help my child. Well, then you've got to agree to do the same thing uh, to them. That's why I think the even though we always have the temptation for aggression, for theft, for exploitation, uh, the in the long run, as long as we can make any agreements with each other at all, those agreements will tend to go toward cooperation and altruism because it makes everyone better off. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's a way in which I agree with Nicholas Christakis. And it's a way in which I, I have shown that that is uh, uh, more or less the direction of history, the, um, but with lots of reversals and exceptions and backward motion. Again, I don't have to remind the people of Ukraine about that, but that uh, the overall trajectory of um, uh, homicide has been down, of um, uh, of violence against women, of slavery, of uh, cruel torture uh, and, and capital punishment. All of those over the long run have uh, gone, gone down, but it, it, never in a straight line, always with, uh, with, with, uh, with wiggles. And I think there's a reason for that. I don't think that God smiles on us. I don't think there's a force in the universe that lifts us ever upward. Uh, I think it's because it's more rational to cooperate and be altruistic. It's more rational for everyone, as long as you can all come to an agreement and you can prevent the cheaters, the exploiters, from trying to get more benefits to themselves. Yeah, and maybe it's a segue to um, a bigger conversation. Maybe we step out of um, your scientific field from psychology and linguistic to international relations and political science. But perhaps we can extend this logic to, you know, bigger groups, governments, countries. Um, so do you think there is a model or can humanity come up with a model and set of rules to prevent governments and countries from, you know, cheating and abusing and deflecting? Because now we live in the era of, we still have wars, as you mentioned. Yeah, so I'm trying to figure out whether it's possible to enforce countries uh, not to cheat? Huh? Yes. No, that's a, that is an excellent question. So within countries, how do you prevent a government from cheating and exploiting its own people and um, uh, for, for government to become uh, autocratic, dictatorial? Um, and that, of course, is the whole idea behind democracy, behind um, mechanisms that prevent one man from... Uh, using the, the government to further his own ends, to his own glory, his own power, his own wealth. In a well-functioning democracy, there are constitutional safeguards that are designed to try to prevent that from happening. Uh, on the um, international scale, uh, uh, of course, we don't have a world government. <clears throat> we have uh, a set of in more informal arrangements like the United Nations, like the uh, treaties, like the European Union, uh, that uh, try to, uh, in, the, in the absence of a global police force, which we don't have, but still try to hold governments into cooperative uh, agreements by uh, punishing them, as we've seen in, in the case of Russia, with economic sanctions, 
with moral condem condemnation, such as the resolutions from the, the General Assembly of the United Nations, from other international organizations, even the Eurovision Song Contest, and Russia was kicked out, the uh, G8 and Russia was kicked out. Now, there's no guarantee that these punishments and sanctions will actually force uh, rogue nations to behave. Just like within a country, there are laws against murder, but people still commit murders. We try to make the laws as effective as possible, but of course they can't be, can never be 100% effective. And that's even more true in the international stage where we don't have a, 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 an international police force, an international, we have an international criminal court and a, and a world court, but um, we have, uh, and the United Nations, but as we know, it's, it's partly effective and, um, uh, but not very far from perfect. Yeah. And it, that is a difference in history because in, uh, prior to 1945 and the uh, United Nations and the agreement among nations who joined the UN not to commit uh, aggression, that is not to start a war except with the approval of the Security Council or in self-defense. Again, Russia is an outlaw, a criminal. Uh, but before that, it was perfectly fine for countries to conquer um, territory from other countries for all kinds of reasons. And crucially, they could count on the international community recognizing the conquest. The United States did it in the 19th century. They declared war on Mexico because Mexico uh, had not paid back some debts. And the United States conquered California and Arizona and uh, uh, Nevada and, and uh, Colorado and annexed them and made them part of the United States. And the whole world said, okay, we recognize that. Mm -hmm. So that was the old regime, uh, global regime, and it has changed. No, the, the Russia's uh, claims to Crimea, to Eastern Ukraine are not recognized by the world community. Now they've, that hasn't stopped them from doing it, but uh, on the, over the long run, in terms of the overall message sent to, to nations, that is the set of rules that we live by. Yeah. And if we kind of turn the table, so we already, you discussed Russia and some irrationality behind, you know, making the aggressive move. But I also wonder um, if we think about Ukraine. Yeah, I guess a lot of people did not expect that so many people would uh, sacrifice uh, the lives to defend the nation, and uh, you know the world was quite surprised by the resistance and resilience of Ukrainian uh, army and citizens. So, is this? Can you say that this is rational? You know, to defend your country. So, how come um, people can give lives for some you know abstract concepts of statehood and nationhood and? Uh, whether this behavior fits the model that you describe in your book uh, or this is an outlier. So can you give a reflection yeah. about this? Yeah. Well, again, it's the it, it gets back to our definition of rationality from the beginning of the uh, conversation. But rationality is the use of knowledge to pursue a goal. And the, uh, the goal um, is not dictated by any particular model of rationality. Now, of course, we can discuss uh, and evaluate goals, whether one goal is inconsistent with another goal that we hold. Uh, we talked about why, in general, cooperative goals, altruistic goals are better than purely selfish ones by the criterion of your own well-being over the long run. But um, putting aside that abstract idea, the... Uh, the uh, idea that rationality is deployed in service of a goal would certainly apply to whether your goal is the preservation of uh, a, a, a state, a, a government. Now, um, if your goal is a, a, a free and independent Ukraine, then um, being part of the military that um, uh, ensures that that will happen is is uh, is highly rational. Now, if your only goal is to protect your own life, uh, then that may not be rational. Again, the rationality is defined with respect to a goal. Now, in the case, uh, however, of defending your country against an invasion, there it does again. If your if your goal is what do I do to keep myself alive, maybe it's not so rational. 
But if your goal is also the well-being of my children, of my uh, the other my neighbors, the other people that I uh, live with, and if the goal is also to be respected by them as a member of a society that uh, where the people all cooperate, especially in the time of greatest uh, danger, where they're willing to take risks, um, then uh, the respect from your uh, community and the, um, the longer term goal of all the benefits that come from being part of an independent um, and free society would say that it, that it can be rational. Now, there is a, in, in the case of military service, there is a funny consideration of rationality in that even if, um, let's say there is a goal that all the citizens uh, desire, they want to be free, they want to be prosperous, they want to be safe. Let's say that in order to attain that goal, you've got to take a risk at your own life. Is that rational or not, according to the theory of expected utility? I mentioned that as one of the models of, of uh, normative models of rationality. Well, it's in terms of the probability, uh, if I have uh, some small chance of getting killed, but if I am not killed, then there is a, a chance that I and everyone uh, around me will prosper, will live a better life. That can be rational. We all take chances. We all uh, get into a car with some a chance of getting killed in a car accident because the benefit of driving, getting to work, seeing our, our, our families and our friends is worth the risk of getting killed in a car accident. Likewise, in an, um, joining an uh, armed service, you, the benefit of living in a free country um, can offset the chance that you take of being killed in defending your country. But that's why it's often in military planning, it has to be a probability, it has to be a lottery ticket. There are very few armies that have just pure kamikaze suicide missions. Sometimes they do, but in general, the logic of, of military is every soldier knows they have an, a fair and equal chance. So they might get killed, but then they might, their army might uh, enjoy victory and then they would be better off. Uh, often what happens in a situation of panic or uh, rout, what has happened, of course, to the many of the Russian army units in the last couple of months, is as soon as each soldier thinks there's a 100% chance that I'll get killed if I stay and fight, that's when you often get panic and surrender. And often military strategists try to convey that impression to the enemy, that is, if every enemy soldier thinks, it's no longer a lottery. I'm going to die if I stay. Then they panic and they flee. It's also interesting to think how people, when making decision choices and rational choices, we often assume something about rationality of another part, yeah, of a yeah. counterpart. We think that they might have some their own strategic choices. We have to take them into account. And uh, in this war between Russia and Ukraine, when so many political pundits and scholars and strategists that try to predict the next move of Putin, thinking if he's crazy or is he wise, is he rational or not irrational. And it seems from what you're saying, sometimes you don't need to assume anything. You know, you just have to believe in your own goals and apply the better strategy and better uh, intellectual tools and devices to follow your strategy. Is this uh, a correct? Um... No, I wouldn't put it that way. And this is the part, the normative model of rationality called game theory. Mm -hmm. Namely, how do you, what is your, uh, how do you att attain your goals uh, when the uh, outcome depends on some other agent who's trying to attain his goals? Now, this is, gets into a very tricky situation. First of all, do you know what the goals of the other player are? Uh, how rational is the other player? Uh, and then uh, your own rationality has to be to try to select the best move, given that you're playing against someone else who's trying to select his best move. And so the, and, and again, with, with Putin, it's a question of what, what is he seeking? Um, and uh, what are his options in uh, seeking them? Now, mm -hmm. there's uh, often 
we often resist thinking that way because you think if I try to get inside the other person's head, if I try to see the world from his point of view, am I justifying his, uh, his position, his point of view? Um, and it, it feels like if I, if I try to say, what does he want? Uh, what would I do in his shoes? It's almost like saying, well, it's okay. It's, I'm, I'm recognizing that his goals are legitimate. Now, of course, that does not follow just like if we are trying to trap a dangerous animal, uh, we don't have to think that it's good that the animal is threatening us. We've just got to uh, think, know the cause and effect, what is going to affect that animal, what is the animal likely to do and, and be smarter than that animal. And that's what we ha all sometimes have to do when de dealing with a, uh, another, an adversary who may be irrational in some ways and rational in other ways. We could uh, optimally, figure out what he wants, what he's going to try to do, so that we can uh, stymie or foil or defeat it. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I think I will, um, I see that some people in, in the audience, they also want to ask their questions. I will ask my final question and I will um, read the questions from other people. You know, if we want to think about the future, you know, the better world, especially given so many challenges which we face with uh, climate change and pandemics and political violence and everything. So it seems that we need to have more rationality in the world. And I guess my question is, how can we ensure that we can have more rationality in the world? Do you believe in some educational systems, media or civil society that can bring more rationality to our societies? All, all three of those, I think it, it has to start with education, that, that uh, students should learn about some of the tools of rationality, like um, Bayes' theorem, probability, logic, correlation, and causation. Um, they should, but it also should be part of our civil society in the sense that when we have debates, arguments, conversations, we should know about the common fallacies of reasoning and how to avoid them, like arguing from an anecdote or an example or a stereotype, uh, like attacking the person instead of the idea, like um, um, uh, criticizing an idea based on where it came from instead of whether it is true or false. All of these fallacies of critical thinking should be part of our common understanding in newspaper editorial writers, in politicians, and in just everyday conversation. But also we need to strengthen the institutions that um, bring people together to exercise their common rationality, where if one person uh, uh, commits an error, another person can point it out. That's the basis for free speech, that if a leader, political leader has a policy, then other people are free to criticize it. If it's the basis of a court system where you've got a prosecutor, but then you also have a defense attorney, it's the basis of science where if you have an idea, you have to test it. Uh, if you're uh, an academic, you have to pass peer review and have other people decide whether or not your article gets published. All of these are ways of taking an imperfect species, namely us, homo sapiens, and trying to uh, make us follow rules that make groups of us more rational than any individual can be. So we need that at the level of, of schools, we need that at the level of nations, and we need that at the level of the, the, the whole world. We, you know, we, we don't have it uh, robust enough, strong enough, but, but we ought to, to push it. That is recommendations from international panels, uh, including the ability to criticize, uh, and other ways in which we try to promote rationality as an as a, an ideal, as an aspiration for everyone. Yeah, could not agree more. And you know, especially in this forum, uh, you know, talking to our students, I cannot uh, stress it enough: the value of rationality and you know, fighting for rationality. I think it's a it's a very important um, goal and cause. Um, I see that there is one person who is anonymous. He raised the question in the chat. I will just read this question. Um, what do you think about human social instincts, instincts and their role in society? So I guess um, 
are there human social instincts at all and if there are if this is the thing what are the role in society yeah. yes well we do have instincts that um, allow us to cooperate as a society we talked earlier in the conversation about uh, altruism and um, the benefits of cooperation but at the same time the danger that a cheater will try to exploit cooperation and, and derive a selfish benefit. That's why we have social instincts like anger and guilt and shame and trust and gratitude and sympathy. The instincts are all, uh, I think, evolved so we could get the benefits of cooperation without being exploited. Now they, um, that is, I can, if, uh, uh, if I see that you're in need, I'm prompted to do you a favor, but then I expect you to remember the favor. And if I'm in need, that you should pay me back. Uh, I'll be angry if you don't. You'll probably feel gratitude. You might feel guilt if you don't. All of these emotions make us cooperative. Now, in a complex, complex society of millions of people with technology and, uh, and literacy, our social instincts aren't enough. Um, they, uh, that's why we have laws and why we have constitutions and why we have governments and court systems because with especially when we're dealing with strangers uh, i can't count on you remembering a favor that i've done for you if you're a part of a million millions of people in society and we've never met before but still um i want you to trust me enough that if i give you some money you'll give me a quart of milk or a pair of jeans or a car and uh Pure trust isn't going to do it. You walk into a car dealer and say, uh, let me drive the car out. I'll pay you next uh, next month. Uh, they're going to say, forget it. I don't, I don't trust you that much, even though you have a nice face. We need contracts. We need bank accounts. We need credit cards and so on. So in a complex society, social instincts are not enough. Uh, we need the, uh, the laws and the formal institutions. Another example is we all have an instinct to punish wrongdoers. Um, that's one way that in traditional societies we can cooperate because any cheater will be punished. On the other hand, the human instinct for revenge and punishment can be savage. That's why you get uh, horrible forms of torture and capital punishment and uh, often blood feuds, cycles of violence where each side attacks the other out of revenge and until they're all dead. A court of law where you have a neutral third party is better than relying on our social instincts uh, of uh, punishment and revenge. Yeah, thank you. And there is another question which is posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, the question is asked by a person with a nick Red Lion. And this person tries to uh, find some, you know, um, contradictions with uh, maybe your other um, books and papers which you wrote um, previously. So the question is, if you think rationality is scarce, why do you think living in modern society is better than any other time in history? So I don't know if this claim yeah. is true or not, but perhaps you can address this uh, statement. Well, I think it's precisely because we have institutions that are artificial, they're, they've been created since the Enlightenment, um, and, and norms that make us more rational as a society than any of us is individually. We have science, not, and the, when we have science, it's not because uh, there are brilliant scientists and we tell them what is the truth, and the scientist says, here's the truth. Uh, science works because scientists criticize each other's ideas and they have to test them. Likewise, in a successful democracy, it's not that we have a uh, benevolent dear leader. No human being is uh, perfectly pure. Uh, it's that we have constraints so that a leader can only do certain things and, and is subject to uh, elections, subject to the legislature, subject to the constitution, and, so, and, and on and on. It's, um, it's a good question because the benefits that we have enjoyed don't just come from pure human nature. They come from our norms and institutions that we have invented precisely because our own nature by itself is not enough. It, ha it has the ingredients, but all of the benefits of modernity come from these modern institutions. Right. As um, 
As a sociologist myself, I'm always pleased to uh, hear when other scholars talking about institutions and recognize their value. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat or in YouTube. I think it's a, you know it's a good time to wrap up our conversation. Yeah, Just the final questions, perhaps um, uh, you could say some you know a, a message to our students, uh, Ukrainian students who are now you know uh, live in these difficult times. Maybe you can you know just. Um, uh, say a few words about what they can do to become a better students and to ensure that they can, you know, maintain a rational life and, uh, and improve society that they live in. Yes. Well, it, it's an honor to, to address the um, students of Ukraine. Um, it is, uh, I guess I will uh, offer just a reminder. I don't, I, I don't claim that this is going to be comforting, but the, what has happened in Ukraine is, um, a real violation of the uh, historical events. It is an anachronism. It is a uh, going against the direction in which uh, virtually every other country in the world uh, has gone. It would be like coming across a uh, primitive tribe that was still sacrificing virgins to uh, appease an angry god. We know that that happened. We know that most civilizations went beyond it. We know that some of them backslid uh, and um, one hopes that the backsliding is temporary or like slavery. Uh, uh, all ancient civilizations practice slavery. Then one by one countries abolished slavery. Some of them went in the wrong direction for a while. France under Napoleon, first they abolished slavery, then they brought it back. But then they of course abolished it again. Uh, I think wars of conquest are in that category. They are uh, tragically uh, not in the, uh, the, 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 the garbage heap of history yet, but uh, that, that's where they deserve to be. And uh, that's where um, I, I think when, when this war is uh, over, where they will return. It's also good to keep in mind how, not only how, um, anachronistic, old-fashioned, primitive, barbaric the invasion is, but how irrational it is, even by the standards of uh, Putin himself. What did he want to do? He wanted to, um, uh, to create disunity in the Ukrainian people, failed. He tried to create disunity in the West, failed. He wanted to halt the expansion of NATO, failed. He wanted to show how powerful the Russian military was, failed. He wanted respect from the world as to what a great nation Russia was, failed. Now, uh, it, the fact that he failed doesn't mean that he can't do a lot of damage and harm, which I don't have to tell you he is doing, but it is not as if he is being rewarded. His irrationality is on full display. But finally, and this is, a, I guess, another message, I think that the people of Ukraine have really um, done a service to humanity because so many uh, of us have, including in the West, but in all parts of the world, have taken for granted the benefits of living in a, uh, a rational liberal democracy. Uh, it's become uh, uncool, it's become old fashioned, it's become just, oh, it's the establishment. People forget that living in a liberal democracy is a real privilege. It is a rare accomplishment. Uh, we've gotten, I think, in, in the West too complacent and have uh, lost the appreciation the set of, of the benefits of democracy. The people of Ukraine are reminding the world that these are great ideals. This is the society we should aim for. It is worth fighting for. It is worth dying for. Uh, it is becoming a, uh, an inspiring, heroic message. And for that, I think the world will always be grateful to the people of Ukraine. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your uh, message and kind words. We really appreciate it. And it is an honor to hear it from you, especially. So thank you for your time and for talking to our students. And I hope we can engage you in the future and invite in person to the peaceful Kiev. Thank you so much. I, I really uh, do hope to return to Kiev. Thank you for having me. Thank you.